So how would you define yourself? How would you describe yourself to someone? Hi, my name's, I'm, how would you start? Maybe you define yourself by, I'm a homeowner. Maybe you define yourself by the car you drive, or I'm a family man. Maybe you, do, you define yourself by your career, your job. You know, when we ask children, what do, you want to, what do you want to be when you're big? Defining them by their job. In Germany, was machst du? What do you do rather than what do you be? Kind of thing. How do you define yourself? Would you agree, actually, that the most important thing about a person is what they think about the Lord Jesus Christ? The most important thing about a person is what they think about the Lord Jesus Christ because it defines today, it defines tomorrow, and it defines eternity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read about the Lord Jesus Christ. We've done that. And we're going to think through what Mark says to him and says about him. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the center and the core and the source of all things and the end of all things. And he is our entire context, our entire context. And either we recognize that or we live in a make-believe world. So, Mark is a great gospel, by the way. If you haven't read Mark for a little while, uh, it's fast-paced. It's about the busy servant of Jehovah. It's got 19 miracles and 16 chapters, 678 verses, okay? Uh, it'll take you about 1 hour 25 to read. That's half of a film that you might watch, okay? Uh, so, it doesn't take long to read, 16 chapters, very fast-paced. And his purpose in writing is to teach us about, well, actually, do you have your Bible open? You have your Bible open in Mark chapter 1. If you just read the first verse with me together, the, begin, the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So Mark's purpose in writing is so that you'd believe and understand that Jesus is the Messiah, God's chosen anointed one, the Son of God. And in fact, if you then look at the end of the gospels in John chapter 20, uh, verse 31, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing you might have life through his name. And so not only are we to know the fact of who Christ is, but we're to put our trust in him. And then when you get to 1 John chapter 5, uh, and you're going through the rest of the New Testament and you've gotten eventually to 1 John chapter 5, he says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes, we've got that. And that you might know that you have eternal life. And so the Lord doesn't just want you to know the facts, but he wants you to have a strong conviction of the fact that you have a savior and the fact that you're going home. And if you don't have that today, if you're stuck there, if you're not relying on the savior and know, well then maybe today we'll, we'll be able to, with the spirit of God, um, find some answers there by looking at the person of Christ, because he is a wonderful savior. So that's Mark and, and why he wrote. Now, if you look at the, at the passage today, and we'll start at verse 35, and we're just going to work our way through, if that's okay, kind of just verse by verse, really. But the first section um, is the coming of Christ, if you like. And we're, we're going to get to, oh yes, oh yes, here's our title. It's called Trading Places. I'm going to let you guess, okay, why I've chosen the title Trading Places. Some of, you, some of you may remember the film, The Way Back Then, uh, about a millionaire who traded places with, with a beggar. Uh, and that was, a, it was a, a, quite a funny story. Well, it's Eddie Murphy, wasn't it? So it's bound to be a funny story. But I'll let you guess why I've entitled this Trading Places. Swapping. Yeah. You might work it out as we, as we go through the passage, okay? So I'll leave that to you just to, as, a, as a soup song, okay? So, so we're going to start with verse 35. And what you see is coming of Christ. See, Christ comes, and early in the morning, he gets his power through prayer. And I hope you do the same thing. He gets his power through prayer. Then Simon Peter comes along and his companions, and they look for him, and they make this proclamation that he's being sought after. He's just done a miracle. He's been healing many. He's been driving up impure spirits right, left, and center. And he's becoming popular for his miracles. 
for his miracles. And he's being thronged for his miracles. And people just want more, more, more. Give me, give me, give me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Simon says, you're popular. You're making it. This is amazing. Go to your fans. And the Lord Jesus says, no, I'm not going to go to my fan base. Because what does he say at the, in verse 38? Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages, not to my fan base. I'm not going to play to the crowd. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can teach there also. So he traveled through Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. See, it's not about the miracles. His purpose was the message. Yeah? The miracles were just a means to an end he, uh, to, to substantiate his authority in his message. And so Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, 1 John 4 says, we love him because he, can somebody help me? Thank you very much. You're brilliant, aren't you? Ah. <laughs> we love him because he first loved us. And as we look at this miracle together, the first thing we need to realize is that Jesus came to us. He didn't come to us to put on a magic show. He didn't come to us to be the great entertainer and to do miracles that people would go wow at. He came with a message. He came with a message of reconciliation with God for those who don't deserve it and can't achieve it. That was his message of reconciliation. Please be aware that salvation is from Christ alone, in Christ alone, from Christ alone. Yes. He came for us. He came for you to give all. So let's not think that we are the center of our universe. Let's not think that we are, it's all about us. It's all about me, me, me. The source and the destination is Christ, and he came for us. So then we come to actually our first point, uh, and so we're coming to verse 40, and, uh, and our excellent IT team is going to uh, say, leprous lament. And we're going to just look at verse 40 together. Let's read it. The man with leprosy came to him, begging him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So here's a man coming to Christ, leper's lament. Now, this is Hansen's disease. And now uh, the, the note says that it could be many diseases, uh, many skin diseases in terms of what the word means. But the, uh, what you can see from the effect of what happens here, that it was a serious one. And that will that, that, be the Hansen's disease. That will be leprosy. Uh, and what you, uh, what you find is that this is a very dire ailment. In fact, could you maybe turn with me to Leviticus chapter 13? Um, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 13 and 14, and we might, you might just keep your finger in that kind of area because we might pop back every now and then. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And chapter 13, the first three verses, in chapter 13, the first three verses, it describes the symptoms of leprosy. Yeah, and actually the priest back then, as they were wandering through the desert, they've escaped Egypt and they're now going through the desert and, and Moses has been given some, uh, some ways of living for the, for the believers uh, and uh, the priest becomes a bit of a doctor actually. And in Leviticus 13, we read, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when anyone has a swelling or a rash or a shiny spot on their skin that may be a defiling skin disease, they must be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons who is a priest. The priest is to examine the sore on the skin, and if the hair on the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be more than skin deep, it is a defiling skin disease. And when the uh, priest examines that person, he shall pronounce them ceremonially unclean. And so this describes the symptoms of what we call leprosy. Uh, and it's got the, blotch, uh, the blotches and the bleaching. And what happens is that the nerve endings die, and so you cannot feel things. And as a result of not feeling things, then you get injured and you don't notice. Yeah? And there are lots of stories about people putting their hands into flames and things to grab things, and everything's burning and stuff, and they don't realize because they've got leprosy and the nerve endings are dead anyway. And so the nerve endings are killed, so the injuries are not felt, and so they go untreated, and so therefore you get maimings, etc. And also, 
the person who had the disease was ceremonially unclean, which means they couldn't go to the yeah, they couldn't go to at the time to the tabernacle, they couldn't go to the synagogue, they couldn't go to the temple when it was eventually built. Yeah, in the time of Christ, it would have been built, obviously. Yeah, so they couldn't go there. They were, they were outside of society, they were outside of the synagogue, they were separated from God and man. Leprosy, Ceremony un, ceremonially unclean. And if you then, back in Leviticus 13, if you just read two more verses with me, verses 44, or 45 and 6, Leviticus 13, 45 and 6, what's the effect of this? How are they to behave? Anyone with such a disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkept, kept, uh, cover the lower part of their face, they had to wear a face mask, uh, and cry out, unclean, unclean, as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean, they must live alone, they must live outside the camp. What a terrible existence for them. What a terrible existence for them, all alone out there. And so they had to live outside town, outside the camp, the disease ate this man up and cast him out of synagogue and society, and he was powerless, powerless to do anything about it. He was on his own. Couldn't do anything about it until Christ came along. Now, you know what I'm going to say now, but I'm going to say it. There's a parallel here with sin. This is a very simple gospel message today, but there's a parallel here with sin. And Romans 3, verse 23 says that every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God is magnificently holy, and we are grubby little creatures. And we prefer our sin to God. You prefer your sin to God. In your old nature, that's what you prefer. And you know it, don't you? And you're stuck with it. And you're helpless with it. And Romans 7 says, oh, wretched being that I am. Who can save me from this, from this, ah, this body of sin? And there's an effect of that. And Isaiah 59 verse 2 says that our sins, our iniquities have separate, have put a separation between us and our God. The extent of sin is that we all have it. And the effect of sin is that we are separated from God. And unless we get this barrier taken down, then we will be eternally separated from our God because death is the eternalization of life. And the decision that you make at life about Christ will carry on throughout eternity. Because God's a gentleman and he's not going to force himself on you, is he? So have you chosen Christ? Because the most important thing about a person is what they believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, verse 34, you see the extent of sin and the effect of sin, but listen to this, the enslaving of sin. The Lord Jesus says, truly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a servant to sin, is a slave to sin. We are unable to do anything about it. No matter how hard we try, we can't beat it. You know, I often think about, uh, with my children, about mobile phones. It's probably a discussion, mobile phones, yeah? How can one person, one individual, beat 100,000 algorithm writers in California who are trying to get their attention? It's an unfair battle. How can one person beat the power of the prince of the power of the air? in the battle for their soul. They cannot. We are helpless. So just like this leper, we all have an issue separating us more seriously than this man, in fact. <laughs> and we can do nothing about it because no amount of turning over new leaves can free us from the slavery to sin. And this is the lament of mankind. We are separated we are from God and we are alone. And the thing about hell and the lake of fire is that you're eternally alone. Do you realize the exceeding sinfulness of sin? You're not going to be drawn in by it, are you? 
you're not going to think it's really cool, are you? The leper's lament. So, in verse 40 then, we see this man coming to Christ. And so this uh, poor man comes to Christ, and let, let's just go back to Mark chapter 1. Now, keep, keep your finger in, in, in Leviticus, because we'll, we'll come back to it. But if you go back to Mark chapter 1 now, uh, because that is after all our passage, uh, and if you go back there, and I can't find it, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Now, verse 40, he comes begging on his knees. He comes pleading, kneeling. He's humble, having nothing to offer to God. He's humble, and he comes in faith. What does he say, if you're willing? You can make me clean. So this man is coming humbly to the Lord, and he's coming in faith to the Lord. You can make me clean, but he's coming in doubt to the Lord somehow as well. He's coming in faith, but, but if you're willing, if you're willing, why wouldn't the Lord be willing to, 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 to save this man who was unclean? Why would the Lord, the, the, the rabbi, the, the one who uh, everybody looks to as a shining example, why would he want to touch this man and, and you know, he, he could maybe catch it? You know, uh, and and why, why would Christ, the one who's trying to make a name for himself at the beginning of the gospel, why would he... <laughs> Touch this outcast, uh, who everybody that he's whom Christ is trying to reach shuns. What, what, what the Lord could say, No, you're unclean. No, I might catch it. No, you're really unpopular with the people I'm wanting to reach. No, I'm not going to go anywhere near you, fella. But the Lord comes humbly, uh, the man comes humbly in faith, knowing his own unworthiness. And knowing, therefore, that it's all up to, it's, it's all up to Christ, isn't it? It's not about what he's bringing. He can't bribe Christ into doing something. He can't put something on the table for the Lord Jesus Christ. Can he? No, he's got nothing. <coughs> he's the one who saves. He's the one who sanctifies. And he will fully redeem body and soul one day. I wonder sometimes, sometimes as a Christian, one, one begins to think, okay, I got saved through faith and I get sanctified through doing. Let's get busy, busy, busy. And the Lord will expect us to follow the disciplines of the godly life. But it's a Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. And the great work that we're doing and offered, and yes, we do everything that we can to reach the lost, and it must be the Lord's doing, his word being given out, the literature being given out, his spirit working through us in conversation. It must be the Lord's, and let's pray for that as we reach out. And so the next point then is verse 41, uh, and it's 12 o'clock already. When, when, when do you normally finish here? Yeah, yeah about one or two o'clock, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, 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 look at the, we'll look at the next piece now. Um, yeah, Christ's compassion. Now, um, NIV says Jesus was indignant. Uh, the King James says compassion. ESV says moved with pity. And I, I, th I think that's maybe a, a good uh, description of the word actually is, are you ready for this? Original language word. Splag chniz omia. Okay. There we go. Yeah, I'm not going to say it again. And it means a yearning of the bowels, the seat of pity, a yearning of the bowels, a gut wrenching longing and compassion is what the Lord felt for this man. A gut-wrenching, yearning, longing for this man. Jesus was filled with this gut-wrenching longing for this man, and he reached out his hand and he touched the man. Now, if, if it was you, if it was you, and this man, unkempt, wearing rags, unwashed, dirty, dusty from the road, and it came up, up to you, what would your reaction be? But my Lord is not like me. I'm glad that he doesn't fit into the mold that I try to project onto him sometimes. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Mark 11, 19, they said of him, he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, yes, he is. And Mark 5, 30, I love this. It's a couple of chapters later. Uh, remember the uh, Jairus' daughter, J J Jairus comes along, but then he's interrupted by a woman who touches the hem of his garment. Yeah, yeah, you remember that story? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it says that this woman with internal bleeding was healed and the Lord felt the power leave him. He felt the power leave him. Can I just say, when he died for you, he felt every drop of God's wrath more deeply than we can feel anything. When he calls you to follow him, he is yearning for you with every fiber of his eternality. Christ is deeply invested. Gut-wrenching yearning. Christ is deeply invested in our needs. He is deeply sympathetic to our troubles. He is deeply compassionate. I don't know what your picture of God is. But the Lord Jesus Christ here grips me. He's not some aloof, judgmental being. He is deeply invested in your good. Jesus, lover of my soul. Get to know Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ. I'm spilling out of the Bible. So Christ's heart was moved and his hand was moved and he touched someone who had not been touched for many, many years. And how much have felt for that man. No one else would touch him, but the Lord did. Oh no, so Jesus is unclean now. Oh no, so Jesus has leprosy now. Eek. No. Christ was permanently untouched by sin or the curse, until he voluntarily, voluntarily takes on the sin of mankind. He basically rid Israel of illness during his three years there. But he remains, he didn't have a sick day once. <laughs> no. So Christ is okay, Christ is stable. Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Christ is ready still to receive. Okay, and so Christ's compassion, Christ's compassion leads to cleansing in verse 42. Now, can I just ask you a wee question about this? Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Can I just ask you a wee question? Um, let's do, let's just think back a little bit to what, when Adam was created, okay, how mature was he when he was one minute old? He was completely mature. When Christ calmed the sea, of course, it takes a long time once the wind has stopped for the waves to... When Christ calms the sea, how calm was the sea the second after he said, peace be still? Completely. When Peter's mother-in-law was ill, remember? Mark's gospel as well. Normally it takes, a, you haven't been eating for a while and you have to, you know, it takes you a wee while to recover and you have to have a wee cup of tea, yeah? yeah? Um, when Peter's mother, not to Belfast coming out, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when Peter's mother-in-law was ill, to what extent was she able to immediately serve others and make them a wee cup of tea? Um, yeah? Christ dealt with the cause and the effect Christ is the root and the offspring. I like that. He dealt with the cause and the effect of the sin and the cause and effect of the illness, sorry, in this case. And so what you're seeing here is this man whose muscle would have, would have atrophied over time, yes, whose skin was, uh, was very, very damaged. Makes you think back to 2 Kings, uh, Naaman chapter five. And when he came out, oh, having washed the seventh time, his skin was as, as anyone describe? Like, it, yeah. This man did not need to go into rehab. <laughs> he was completely uh, cleansed 
the word for leprosy is cleansed rather than healed because he was ceremonially unclean, yeah? He was completely cleansed. In fact, you can tell that because Christ told him to, to go to Jerusalem to the temple uh, to, to show himself to the priest, and that was 80 miles away. <laughs> so so the, the man would have been well to do that. When it comes to your sin and the guilt that you and I suffer at times, maybe for things done yesterday or maybe for things done 20 years ago, Christ cleanses completely. When you put your faith in Christ, God sees the righteousness of Christ completely when he looks at you. You are saved from it. You are cleansed from it. And in Calvary, Christ became sin, sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through him. He took on, clothes himself in our sin for the punishment of it so that we can be clothed in, in righteousness. And when God looks at me, Weirdly, he sees the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God looks at you, extraordinarily, he sees the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. I really must carry on. So, so then, uh, verses 43 and verse 44, Christ commands, uh, I'll not go back to Leviticus because uh, I'm taking too long. So, so he commands the man first to go through the proceedings, the procedures to show himself clean. And it's Leviticus 14, if you want to look it up later. Leviticus 14, 13, the problem, 14, the procedure, okay? Um, and so describes a process for the priest to approve that the letter has been, that the leper has been cleansed. And just the same way as you'll need to look that up afterwards, I'm sure the priest would have as well, because he wouldn't have had a clue, because it never happens, okay? And I, and I believe it probably was written for this very occasion. Because what does it say? Uh, it says to be a proof to them. So they, da, 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 da. Yeah, at the end of verse 44, as a testimony to them. He's wanting the Israelites, he's wanting the Jews to see that Christ is following the law. He is a complete fulfillment of all the law. He's not walking all roughshod all over it. He's not doing it my way or the highway. He's following the law. Do what Moses ordered. The priests would see that Christ was obedient to God's word. Not, he does this by the power of the Lord's love. But he's obedient to Christ's word. Yeah, you see? He perfectly fulfilled God's law. And they would have also known, back to 2 Kings chapter 5, when Naaman writes a letter to the king of Israel, says, can you cleanse me of my uh, leprosy, please? And the king of Israel says, who can cleanse a leper but God alone? Well, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so, so then the second thing uh, that Christ commands is, he says, tell no one. Tell no one. So, well, getting certified, the man could understand, but keeping quiet about this? No way. Well, why should he? Why, why, why would he? So he went out and told everyone. He couldn't keep it in. He, uh, you know, he was better. He was well. But, but why would Christ, you scholars, why would Christ be saying, tell no one? Christ's Galilean ministry was crushed by two things. Number one, the public enthusiasm for his miracles. They thronged him, they thronged him, so the people had to climb up on top of buildings and cut holes in roofs. The crowds were so much for the spectacle of the healings, the public enthusiasm for his miracles, and the Pharisaic antagonism for his message. They were seeking to kill him. They were seeking to trick him. And what Christ had to do to have three years of public ministry and to be able to cover the space he wanted to cover, he had to manage the timetable. So he told Mary, my time has not yet come. He's managing a timetable. And this is why he's saying, tell no one, I believe. Argue with me about that at the end if you want, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so Christ's command is then disobeyed. 
And while we may understand the man's enthusiasm, he blatantly disobeyed Christ. Can I just say that the healing was not based on the man's faith? It was based on Christ's compassion. Okay? And there's lots of ramifications for that. If, for instance, you think about it, when Christ raised someone from the dead, the widow of Nain's son, it wasn't based on his faith, right? He was dead. Nor did a healing necessarily lead to faith. Probably a lot of people who were healed were out shouting, crucify him, crucify him, a couple of years later. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, By grace you're saved, through faith, but not even that is of yourselves. That is the gift of God, not of works that anyone should boast. So don't be trying to muster up faith. <clears throat> trying to believe. I'm sure people have gone through that. I've gone through that as a teenager. Trying to say, no. Just rely on Jesus. You're sat in the chair. And you were stood up, and he said, that chair should be okay. You sat on it, and you rested on it. And you're not worried. You're just resting on it. That's faith. Okay. So the command was disobeyed. Just a little note about faith. But then, then we have our final point. Uh, you'll be glad to hear. And it's, it's the next bit in our, yes, the sinless substitute. So the, the, because you see, what happened in verse 45? Let's just read it. Instead, he went out and began to speak freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Trading places. The leper started outside the camp. He was brought into the city. Jesus Christ, our Lord, started inside the city and ended up, due to this man's disobedience, he ended up outside. Yes. Christ traded places with that leper. And that is what he did for you on Calvary. He took your place. <clears throat> the sinless one became sin for us so that we sinners could be given his righteousness in God's eyes. Now, Something else for later, okay? Leviticus. Levit Leviticus is brilliant. Yeah, seriously, it's brilliant. So, Leviticus 16 is the center of the book, really. And it's, it's all about, anybody guesses? Leviticus 16, the day of... No? Well, it would be sort of uh, atonement. Yeah, yeah, so I shouldn't say no. I should have said, maybe try again. No, it's fun, fun. <laughs> um, so... so <laughs> So the, day of the, so, uh, the beginning of Leviticus starts with the offerings, chapter 1 to 7. And the end of Leviticus, chapters 23 on, has the feasts, okay? Beginning and end. Then, from the beginning, 8 to 10 is all about the priests and, and getting their clothing right. And uh, 21 to 22 is all about the priests. Then you have a section about the people, how they're to behave, and how the people, how they're to behave. And then you end up in the middle of chapter 16, which is Day of Atonement. It's the arrowhead of the chiasm. Chiasm, it's, it's, it's the center of the book, Leviticus chapter 16. It's all pointing towards this thing, which is a very strange thing. Because once a year, rather than just offering a sacrifice, the priest takes how many goats? Two. He takes two goats. And one is taken, and the priest lays his hand on the goat and imputes onto that goat the sin of the people. And that goat is sacrificed. Yes, because the second goat then, the priest does exactly the same thing and puts on that goat, the, the sin of the people. That, that goat is sin, both, if you like. And that goat is set free into the wilderness. Yeah? That's a strange thing, isn't it? Why do you do it twice and why? One is taken and is slain. One is taken and is freed. Lord Jesus Christ was slain for me. And I go free. Trading places. Because I deserve that. And he took it. And I can go free. And he deserved to be free. But he died for me. Trading places. Christ was slain so that you could go free. Are you reveling in that? Are you enjoying that? Are you living in, in, in the thankfulness of that? If you're not a believer today, 
don't turn away from the Savior who came to seek and to save. The one who longs with a gut-wrenching compassion for you to recognize your, your need and, and to come to him. The one who loves your eternal soul. The one who can cleanse you from your sin because he traded places with you at Calvary. So that you can be freed from the power of sin now and eventually the presence of sin in eternity. And if you're a believer today, and times sometimes get dry or difficult, look again to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, the one who heals completely and feels compassionately. Live and live. May the Lord bless his word.